But I want to share something with you. As I was just doing my morning Bible reading, and again, that's my time with the Lord. That's the time I spend, and I pray that you do as well, I spend getting to know God, getting to know his word. I do not ever read the Bible to get a sermon. I don't read the Bible so I can do a broadcast. I don't read the Bible so I have something insightful to say. I read the word of God, not even because I am driven by some religious obligation that says, well, if you don't read the Bible, then God's not going to really like you. That's bogus. I read the word as you should to get to know God. Who is God? How does he think? And what does he want? I read it out of vital necessity. So Matthew chapter 9 and verse 17. This is a familiar portion of scripture, but it was interesting. Um, a few things got me thinking about this, and then this just happened to be where my scripture reading landed today. Number one, recently, Donald Trump was at, where was he? International Church of Las Vegas, and I'm not making this a political post, I'm just saying he was at International Church of Las Vegas, a church that I'm quite familiar with, and in the worship, they were singing that song, New Wine, from Brooke Frazier, uh, Hillsong. And that's language that we throw around in the church, particularly the charismatic community, a lot. New wine, new wineskins. But let me do my best in just a couple moments to explain what that looks like and what is God doing. So good morning, everybody. Let me know where you're watching from. Most of you, I'm sure, are at some kind of church service, church gathering, a home gathering. And I bless you wherever you are. You can watch this later. Matthew 9, verse 17. This is shocking when you actually read it all in context and really consider it beyond just the exciting, woo, new wine language. It says this, Jesus says this, neither is new wine put into old wine skins. If it is, the skins burst and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed. I was talking to someone recently and they were basically telling me, listen, what God is getting ready to do or what God is in the process of doing. I got to correct myself with language because I am not a big fan of language that puts everything God is doing in the future. You know what's in the future? Jesus coming back. You know what's in the future? The millennial reign of Jesus over the entire cosmos. Do you know what's in the future? The, the son of man splitting the sky and returning to the Mount of Olives. Holy Spirit outpouring is not for the future. I'm ready to run around this room right now because I'm preaching myself happy. Holy Spirit outpouring and revival and renewal, reformation, three things that I'm talking about, doing my best to define renewal, the movement and the activity, the un, oh boy, unrestricted, unhindered activity of the Spirit of God in the church, not as a special event, not as a unique season, as the normative default state of the church. That is normal. Renewal should be normal, okay? That's in the church. Revival should be normal all the time. What does that mean? Simply a renewed church, a church that is touched and experiencing the power of the Spirit. That wonderful outpouring spilling out of the church into the proverbial streets, into all the places where people who don't know Jesus are. And guess what happens when those people come to know Jesus? Well, we don't set them up in the church. Somebody may not like this, but I really don't care anymore. We don't set them up in the church. They don't come to Jesus, and then we communicate some goofball message that the highest and the best use of their effectiveness for the kingdom of God is running a PowerPoint, manning the volunteer parking lot, or working in the children's ministry. Are all those things vital and important? Please hear me, 100%. Yes. Should we do those? Yes. But we cannot communicate this message, and it is a false message, and it restricts the laborers. <laughs> There's a message that restricts laborers, and it is this, and I have heard it, and it is communicated by a lot of well-meaning, good people who love God, but it is an old, no, it's not even an old wineskin. It has nothing to do with anything God's ever wanted to do in the earth, and it's this idea that our highest and best, the fulfillment of your destiny. Have you ever heard something like this? Your destiny will be fulfilled when you use your gifts and talents in the context of the local church. Well, yes, 100%, I believe gifts and talents for somebody who just newly comes to Jesus are actually unlocked in a context. Please hear me. Get the whole picture. They're unlocked in a context of serving in a local church or volunteering in a local church. But the pastoral leadership team must be apostolic enough to recognize that is not the final destination. That is not the ultimate destination. 
of the believer. The ultimate destination of the believer. Going back to Matthew chapter 9, where Jesus basically says, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. He didn't pray. This is how he prayed. Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to raise up laborers. No, to send them out. Send them out. I prophesy right now, I believe there's a lot of competent and capable laborers who have been touched by God, who got saved, radically saved. And I'm just going to say this. They don't belong exclusively preaching in the women's conference circuit or in the women's ministry. They don't belong exclusively as a parking lot attendant. They don't belong exclusively as somebody who does the media and the tech, runs the cameras and the PowerPoint. Those are wonderful things, but that is not where they belong exclusively. And the church needs a paradigm or an operating system where we learn how to disciple and raise up and deploy laborers. In the church is a safe place for them to be discipled and raised up. Unto what? That's my question. Unto what? Unto sending them out to wherever God has given them a vision for I actually believe, and I keep saying this when I pray, I believe the Lord is raising up journalists, supernatural, prophetic, yes, but intelligent, educated, well-learned journalists who might very well go and pioneer new methods of communicating news with integrity. I have no doubt for years the Lord has wanted to raise up Holy Spirit-filled, holiness walking people into Hollywood. You know what? You get discipled in the church. The church should be discipling people with this intention. And I think I'll finish here just because this is just such a new perspective. It sounds so new, but it goes back to what Jesus wanted. Jesus wanted laborers into the harvest, out of the four walls, out of a religious system, into the harvest. Now, the four walls, I believe, are meant to nourish them, are meant to disciple them, are meant to correct them, are meant to be a safe place for them to come back to, are meant to be a place where they're pastored, 100%. So not for one minute do I throw out the operating system of church. I never, ever want to be one of these grouchy, critical folks who's always like, ah, the church, the church. Oh, Jesus chose the church as his vehicle to change the world. However, however, it's one of those things where we must see like he does. And again, we must see every person who gets saved, every person who radically comes to Jesus, because that's the, rev the revival arm of the church. That's when renewal spills outside the four walls and we see people coming to Jesus. Rather than just communicate this message that the highest and the best for that person is just to remain locked up behind the four walls, volunteering in a church, and again, those things are good. I've communicated that. I don't need to explain myself again in this broadcast. If you're hearing me now and you're like, wow, you're being, no, listen to the whole thing. I give good context. We've got to learn as leaders how to raise up people, how to disciple people, to go into every sphere of influence where the devil has run rampant. Now we're seeing that in the earth more than ever. But here's my heart, my goal. I don't want to see those people brought down because what's going on inside of them is not stronger than what's going on around them. What, is it, what does that mean? I'll finish up with this. Because I believe you were created, you were born again for the high places. I'm not talking about high places of promotion and all that, although I do believe God wants people in high places in every sphere of influence. I believe we were redeemed and filled with the Holy Spirit to go into the harvest. And guess what? The harvest is dark. It's bright in the sense that there's great opportunity. It's bright because the harvest is ripe and people are ready to come to Jesus. I believe that. But the harvest, where are you going to find the harvest? You're going to find the harvest in dark places. You're going to find the harvest in places. My goodness, I'm getting revelation right now. You're going to find the harvest in places where those people who are getting ready to be harvested, brought to Jesus... They are under environments, they're in spheres of influence, they're in jobs, occupations, whatever. Where what? Where principalities and powers are in operation, dictating that spiritual atmosphere. But guess what? When believers show up on the scene, when believers who carry the Holy Spirit, 
who is the agent of the kingdom of God in the earth, when we show up to those places where maybe we haven't shown up for a long time because we've preferred the safety of four walls, and that's all right, that message has just been communicated. When we show up to those places, I believe the possibility for harvest multiplies. Why? Because a believer showed up in a place where until that believer showed up, the devil thought he ruled that atmosphere. But when you show up carrying the Holy Spirit and the reign, R-E-I-G-N, and the influence of the kingdom of God into that place, by default, you challenge the devil. And guess what? Greater is he who is living in you than he who is in the world. Finishing up with Matthew 9, 17. You know what? We must be all in a place where we say, God, what are you doing? I want to live in that place. God, what are you doing? It will never contradict the scriptures. When we talk about the new thing, the new wine, the new wine, skin, all that, I, I want to break it down as clearly as possible. It will never be something that contradicts the scriptures. It'll never be something that contradicts what he has done previously. It will always build. It will always agree with his character as revealed in the word. This is why we need to know the scriptures. It'll always agree with his patterns of operation that we've seen evident in the word. But we cannot hold so tightly to the way we've always done things. I believe where we are right now, we've seen it with COVID. We've seen it with just this crazy several months, really since March, um, where any structure, any system that I believe <clears throat> is not compatible with what God is doing right now, it's like the big bad wolf blowing against the house of sticks and the house of leaves or whatever those pigs built their houses with. You understand what I'm saying? It's like the big bad wolf, the breath of adversity, the breath of circumstance, the, be the, the breath of disease, the breath of unstable political climate, the breath of an unstable and very unfortunate racial tension. Um, all of that, it's been wind that has blown against, I believe, the entertainment-driven approach to church. I'm not saying entertainment-driven churches. I'm, I'm saying the entertainment-driven mindset. I believe the wind of circumstance, the wind of adv adversity has blown against it. And I believe many are either crumbling or many are crumbling on the inside and they're giving the appearance that everything is just as normal as it was before all the bad stuff came. And God's giving an opportunity right now. Will you stick with the way you've always done things? Will you stay and will you remain with the way you've always done things? I believe God is leveraging crisis. And you know what he's doing? He's, <laughs> the wind of crisis has blown against the church, but I believe concurrently, simultaneously, the wind of the spirit, the Holy Spirit is blowing against how we've done church. And guess what? <clears throat> and we see it right there, what Jesus says in Matthew 9, 17. If we continue to do things the way we've always done them, and yet God is breaking in with something new, it literally talks about how the old skins, the old wine skins are destroyed. So if we see things, please hear me. If we see things in the church that seem to start to crumble, I want to actually encourage you. Even if you in your own church, you see things. This is a word of the Lord. And I'm, I, I'm done. But, you know, sometimes you just got to like, okay, Holy Spirit, what are you saying? If you see things, pastor, leader, if you see things in your church right now that look like they're crumbling, looks like they are falling under the weight of everything going on in the world, it looks like, okay, how we're doing things does not provide solutions to what people need right now. If it looks like things are breaking and crumbling, be of good cheer. Yes, be of good cheer. Why? It means the Spirit of God is ready right there with the new. Because we see right there in what Jesus says, <clears throat> that if new wine, come on, I'm ready. I'm ready to run on this one. If new wine, the new move of God, the new thing that God wants to do, the new strategy, whatever it is, I don't want to give you hyper charismatic language. Let's make it as clear as possible. The new thing that God wants to do to accomplish his ancient will, because his will never changes, his heart never changes, his character never changes, his word never changes. But the strategies that sometimes he uses change. And if you notice things in your church, in your ministry, I'd say even in your life, crumbling, then say, all right, God, the old doesn't seem to be working right now. 
I ask you, Lord, not only to reveal to me the new, God, show me how I can actually align myself with what you're doing. Because the alternative is this, I'm doing what I think makes sense. I'm doing what's always makes sense up to this point in my life. I'm doing what the church growth strategy manual told me. I'm doing with what those books that I read years ago told me about living a happy and effective life and all <laughs> whatever. And it doesn't seem like it's working. In fact, if that's for somebody right now, whether you're watching now or you're watching later, if you feel like, man, what I'm doing right now doesn't seem to be working, here's my encouragement. Say, Lord, show me the new thing. I want to align with what you're doing. I don't know, I'm not even wanting to focus so much on this language of a new thing. God, show me how to line up, Lord, with what you are doing. Not continue to do what I've always thought made sense or what I've always done or what brought success in a previous season. Lord, show me how to get in alignment with what you are doing. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Amen. All right, blessings to you. Look forward to seeing you guys later. Hope this was encouraging.